And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one, two, three good brothers. Ha 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 ha! We have the living stack of comic books and the man who needs a the end at the end of his statements, good brother Doku. We have... The man who the man who could prob who could probably outpunch a horse without using his fists. Good brother Joel. And we have the man of a thousand runes and the bane of my existence. Good brother Xanatrix. How the fuck we doing tonight? It is a Drink. good night. Drink Horses beware. Yes, I, yes, I, and for those of you who have who have who have read Vinland Saga, yes, I'm referring to that horse punching moment. <laughs> because um, even even losing two fingers, I wouldn't want to piss off Thorkel. If you're if you're smart, this is the guy whose idea of siege warfare is throwing logs at people. Again, if you're smart, don't don't it piss works. off Thorkel. Yeah. So we call strategic creativity right there. So what are we doing tonight, Meldra? So to, so our... um, originally the plan that I had was to br to bring an old favorite in let in Legend System and adapt its track system to the sta to the standard setup of classes in um in D and D. However. I did given the fact that I'm t that I'm dealing with the I'm dealing with those classes in both the um reconstructing classes thing that we did a few months back and the Valley of the, Ju of the Judge series I th I fi I figured that I didn't want to um double dip into that so instead I called an audible and opted in and opted instead to build a track to build a track based system using the job system from the Final Fantasy series, um, I'm so excited. <laughs> and this ended up being this ended up being quite the undertaking. And to and to help give a to help give a bit further explanation and context, I'm going to let Zan fill in some of the blanks. So, uh, friends, enemies, frenemies, whatever you fuck you are, um, let's put it this way. We went through every Final Fantasy except the mobile games. That's the all of the main series from 1 to 15, and unfortunately 10 to. Fuck you, 10 to. I hate you. Um, this includes the MMO games. 11 and 14 are included. They are main series, and they have job systems. Mm -hmm. uh, this included any spin-offs that included job classes, including weird-ass spin-offs like Final Fantasy Explorers. Square Enix's attempt at an answer to Monster Hunter, which would have been great if you could ever fucking get a group. I will. Regardless, I will note that there were two, um, there were two families of entries that we did not include in this for different reasons. One is the mobile games. So, so Brave Exodus, Record Keeper, Dimensions, all the bravest. Fuck we, all the bravest. We did not cover because, as some as some of you are well aware, I have a anti-mobile game policy in the temple. Indeed. Um, the other one that we did not cover is tactics advance, and that's for a different reason. Because don't get it wrong, I loved I love tactics advance, and I like tactics advance a two. The problem is how that how that series handles its job um, trees. I and I would like to point out, like I think that the tactics fell under my purview of like gathering all the class names together, and like yeah, tactic advance like it divides them by the kind of uh, species you can be. Mm -hmm. It it it's really very different than the normal classes, the, the yeah. normal job system. And and we the, the reason we decided to exclude it is that and the fact that the jobs are very much tied into the identity of Ivalice in Tactics Advance and A2. Whereas in the original Tactics, the jobs are jobs, mm -hmm. uh, as per any other job system. And because of that, they aren't as tied into the setting of Ivalice and can be used anywhere else, yeah. including the most overpowered calculated job, Fuck you, calculator. 
Cal calculator is I wouldn't say it's tied to evilies, but it's certainly tied to like the weird way in which you these games manifest to the player. So that's kind of strange. Oh well, so, I think I'm pretty sure we had to exclude it because it can't work within a TTRPG. Well, what is it doing? Like, okay, it, it makes sense when you're playing a video game and you see numbers that a guy messes with the numbers, right? But what's happening in a role playing game then? Does he literally have a magical calculator? Like, what? No, no, leave. Although, you suck. Oh, magical calculator. Should I bring up the app? Should I bring up the abacus that's in Tenra? <laughs> <laughs> Just say, just saying. What is an abacus if if not a primitive form of calculator? Well, when it's when well, it's powered by over. when it's powered by magic, you shoot out shikigami like they're candy. Yeah, and piss off the traditionalists who call you a shiki slinger. <laughs> Slingers, it's so much fun to play, but that's a different game. Mm -hmm. Rails, yeah, why don't we? Yeah. Oh, ten rabancho zero. Lo I love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Drink now. The the obvious the the uh, now I also tossed in some elements from the um, from the ver from the handful of um, tabletop adaptations of fi of Final Fantasy that have, that have been attempted over the years because there's a there's actually a very fascinating um, his history especially when it comes to um, the ret the returners um, gr group and the and the games that were the games that succeeded or were inspired by their work. Um, I came into it, that when they did second edition. Um, then I saw I saw some people branch off from that and do Zodiac. Some people some people keep on and do third edition. And that and then the uh, original returners group kind of splintered off and started doing its own thing until a guy in Bra until a guy in Brazil after um, after Bahamut Academy came out which I unfortunately I can't um, comment on because it's in Portuguese. Decided to do a full-on successor in the form of fourth edition, and a and another another guy in Germany did a did a very OSR-like approach in the form of Omega Fantasy. And full disclaimer: um, the creator of of fourth edition and Omega Fantasy have visited the temple, um, and I've and I reviewed both of them when I did Final Fantasy Week. I was about to say, if you, if any of you watching have an interest in any of the games he mentioned, and maybe in some of the ones he didn't review, a good mm -hmm. place to start is the Final Fantasy Week videos. They're very good in-depth dives. Yeah, I also covered um, fi um, Final Fantasy D20, which uses the Pathfinder rule set, and regardless of what you may think about the Pathfinder rule set, that one is unmatched when it comes to pure content. Um, wait, as far as wait, we're talking about Pathfinder. So we're talking about quality of content or quantity of content. You don't really need the Pathfinder core book for it. But it's basically its own game, just kind of another clone of three oh three five. Yeah, just, but um, that brings us <laughs> to <laughs> the three five clone. That brings us to the legend system, which. The interesting thing, the reason I wanted to use Legend with this is because of its flexibility. Legend uses a track system for its classes. Each class has th has three tr has three tracks, um, and because of because of this setup, what what with them being fast, medium, and slow tracks, although you, although um, I usually have it that they can be arranged in any order, and the speed just means how um, quickly you. You uh, learn. You learn the effect. I des I decided to use that as a base, but because of the fact that we are not going to be doing three tracks for every job, because one that'd take us too long, and two, we two we'd have we'd end up with some cases of overlap. Same amounts of it, in fact. Mm hmm. <clears throat> I des I decided yeah, Final to Fantasy I, jobs, um, like Final Fantasy jobs are kind of notorious for only having one tiny, very game specific mechanical widget that actually distinguishes them, and a whole lot of elaborate art and character art that establishes them. So that isn't really super meaningful in terms of a role playing game rules discussion. Mm -hmm. However, 
the big reason why I chose why why I chose Final Fantasy for this kind of experiment instead of a, instead of another game is Final Fantasy has been extremely consistent over the years with a sense of mythology. In the in the same way that in the same way that I that I can show I can show a set of a set of colors in a certain way and people will immediately think of Superman. I can show I can show cer certain I certain images or certain motifs and people's mind will immediately be drawn to Final Fantasy. And if you ever play the Prelude Arpeggio, everyone thinks Final Fantasy. There's nothing else like it. You Prelude Ar Prelude Arpeggio. Victory fanfare, or the um, or the th the uh, crystal theme. Mm -hmm. Like th those th those three those three those three tracks have been have been inked into my brain. Oh yeah, and more recent examples like to Zanarkin, which I at one point when I was younger and dumber, I actively considered learning the piano just so I could try and play that piece. <laughs> A monk yeah, they... that can play to Xanarkand? I would have loved to see it. <laughs> um, of course, of course. Then I had, I had, I had a, I had a bit of a biking accident, and that, and that ruined that whole prospect. Oh. Um. But. Then, but well, it's like, uh, it's like Siege of, uh, Siege of Magdral. Mm -hmm. We, we recognize those things as. Well, you're never you're never going to hear anything uh, like it ever again. Mm -hmm. It, which is why Final Fantasy, much like uh, much like the Seeds of Magir uh, Magdral and ah, uh, damn, what the hell was the name of the game? Bungie. Uh, what the hell Halo. game? No, not not Halo, it, but they did they did they did put the uh, they did put that uh, that track in Halo. It was a uh, mist. These are these are these are these are things that people recognize as ex essentially extremely. Extremely important uh, cultural aspects, and it's funny because they're video games. Mm -hmm. You you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily view these as oh this is you know some sort of great cultural you know, achievement. It is, and and that's what Final Fantasy is. Final Fantasy is something that most people would look at and go oh it's just a video game it's it's actually much more than that it it is in very it is actually a very important moment in terms of culture and we have to recognize that dope do rails <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, when it comes to discussing what it is and how important it is that is not the purpose here but when I, I was point. looking, I was I was I was tooling around for for a way to figure for a way to figure out how how we how we could um, consolidate consolidate this track system, and then I remembered the four big categories that were used in um, Returner's third edition, and that's and that's what I used as my basis. So so we te we technically have we technically have four classes, but five types of um, track. Of tracks that fit that fit into these archetypes. Rage the, wins. The four classes are warrior, expert, mage, and adept. A fifth part is independent, which are for the sing the um, single track entries. Um, Legend also has these kind of things where they're they're tracks that you can implement into your into your character, but they don't really fit any of the classes. And some of them yeah. are some of them are specifically racial tracks, which we haven't implemented in this particular version. The independent tracks we came up with were uh, were basically anything that just didn't fit the four archetypes for yeah. classes. Um, warriors are 
I, I, the approach that I went with this is that a, any uh, anything that involves um, that involves co that involves combat using using fit using physical weapons or physical means primarily is going to be under the warrior category. Now, note I didn't say melee because um, not all of them are not all of them are going to count under that. So, it's for those of you familiar with, uh, say, Final Fantasy XIV. Your warriors would include samurais, uh, they'd include your paladins, they'd include your dragoons, they'd include your bards, they'd even include your machinists. Um, now, the the expert class is your are your is your skill monkey type of type of um, archetype. The the um, cl the ones that while they do they do do physical combat. What they really bring to the table is some sort of um, non-magical skill. Okay, so that's a uh, that's where I'll rephrase. Actually, then that mm -hmm. um, bards would probably go here. Actually, yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, the th the third class is mage, which is self-explanatory. All of the I'd say all of the disciples of magic count. Um, disciplines of magic, sorry, count under that. Big, big bada booms from your black mages, mm -hmm. and your uh... Uh, the healing from the white mages, um, and then the blue mages just eat things or dance um, with them. Well, I'll get to blue mage in a minute. <laughs> blue mage is not it. <laughs> Lastly, is adepts. Adepts is a catch-all for the hybrid kind of characters. The gishes, the ah, one, the ones, yeah, who, the ones yeah. who, who um, who strat, who straddle the line between between multiple um, arch, between multiple archetypes. Red if, mage, magic knight. Mm -hmm. Paladin be in there then, since they've got healing magic. Um, yeah. No, the paladins mm. paladins aren't exactly a gish though. They sometimes have healing magic and they sometimes don't. I'm really um, like for me the the archetypical paladin is is Cecil, so like I might be biased, um, and that's that's a good point to make. But a lot of paladins in later entries, uh, especially if we're going to consider the MMOs, um, they tend to have maybe one healing spell, and it's usually meant for themselves as a self heal. And uh, beyond that, it, it's they're all about the tank. Yeah. In fact, in fact, the especially since the signature ability for paladins is um, cover. <laughs> cover. <laughs> but the and of course the last is the independent tracks, or which are basically all the things that don't really count. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of appropriate that I en that I ended up with four classes in this regard. So okay, four crystals. Yeah, which makes me which makes me wonder. Okay, the four crystals are based on the Hellenistic elements. You know, fire, water, earth, air. Um, which of the four classes do you think would get which crystal? Warrior gets earth, uh, mage gets fire. I would say that expert gets air, and our adept gishes get water. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm behind that. That's actually perfect. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I say that is because of this. Uh, your warriors are, like you said, primarily the physical type of attackers you have a lot of tanks and warriors you have a lot of uh stolid types of attacking characters in mm -hmm. warrior with mages they're your energetics like you've got like black and white mage outright you, yes one does a big bada heal and the other one does big bada boom but no matter what you're doing it's a lot of energy it's mm -hmm. a lot of energy you can pack so much energy in that thing mm -hmm. uh then with the experts they are, like you said, that they bring that specific set of skills, whatever it might be, to the battlefield, and that's like a cu the cutting edge of wind. Whereas the adepts are your gishes, they're your mixes, and water is the best solvent in the game. Yeah. So we will. S so with this, now something something I do think needs to be pointed out since le since we're using legend system as a base. Um, Signature weapons for e for each is not going to be applicable because of how legend handles weapons. Yep, and uh, I'd also like to point out that uh, also because of the fact of that this is a tabletop game, um, 
limit breaks or anything like that are harder to come by in a, in a unique way. We very cursory said, said that each would get a skill that you would then fill in with fluff. Uh, for example, what we talked about with mage was attacking mages would get a, a one-time big bada boom, maybe hits a giant, uh, giant area, or maybe it hits one thing for a lot of damage, and then you fill it in with the fluff of whatever tracks you've chosen. Whereas the white mages and your healers get a big area heal or a big single time huge ass heal. Uh, again, fill it in with the fluff of your class. Yeah. The big reason now a lot a lot of the a fair amount of the tabletop entries have have attempted a limit break system. But because but the the problem with the problem with trying to do limit breaks in a tabletop form is that the a lot of the limit breaks, um, excluding the M excluding the MMOs, one f one f one because that one because limit break in eleven is not what people would think it is, and in the case of um, in the case of fourteen, the limit breaks are essentially instance only, and they're, you're, and they're you're get out of jail only, free yeah. and your get out of jail free card. It depends on what you use it for, but yeah, if uh, in in most cases the limit break tends to be Save for DPS to chop off the last ten percent of a boss. Mm -hmm. But and the other the other reason is that do is is um doing that doing that particular build build it build it up using using a point system, um, ends up creating a bit too much choice paralysis. Whereas keeping it somewhat th somewhat thematic. Is a is a little bit more apropos in this case. Um, for what is for what's worth, Final Fantasy D twenty kind of does something similar. I didn't even consider limit breaks actually. I guess they wouldn't be too terribly difficult to put in if you really wanted them because I mean, like, really, the the simplest version of that is like what was it, like you get hit and then your track fills up. And then when it fills up, you get you get your special thing. And really, in most cases, in the actual like the numbered games, the special thing is just like a better version of what you were doing anyway. So like, if you're a thief, it's mega steel. If you're a fighter, it's mega buster slash. Mages get like super boom. So like that wouldn't be that difficult to put in. It's a, it's a little gamey, I guess. Like like you, I, what's the what's the rationale for what's happening to the characters themselves? But like, if you really wanted it, it wouldn't be that complicated to put in, really. I do really. want I do want to address the whole ga the whole gamey thing. Um, whenever I whenever I've done any sort of any sort of adapt any sort of adaptation of um of say a video game or the like into a tabletop RPG, I've always I've always made note of a kind of gentleman's agreement, for lack of a better term, that th that that sort of integration is going to happen. That there's there's going to be those kind of gamey elements because of what because of the fact that the people pl the people playing this are probably going to have some genre familiarity. There's a small and amount I, of expectation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's fine. I mean, like famously, what was it Final Fantasy IX? Their limit breaks were an element of the plot, the thing that actually happened to people. So, like, you can integrate it into the the reality of the Final Fantasy verse. It's like they did that. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there is a rationale for it. I, I'm just like, it, it is a little gamey on the surface, but like anything that's gamey, if you just make it a part of the reality of the game world, is suddenly immersive again. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I don't think I don't I don't even think it's a very good critique of it to call it gamey. Yeah, and to to be honest, to be honest, when it comes to when it comes to the gamey part of that, I only really hear that I only hear that more more often than not from um gr from grognards. Well, I'm a bit of a grognard, so that makes sense. No, you're not. <laughs> not, not <laughs> near. Believe, uh, believe. I'm what they call a nouveau grognard. No, uh, I'm, I'm all the grognard, half the calories. No. Uh, J Joel, you you have a mind that whose opinions can be changed. Um, grognards do not. I don't know. I, <clears throat> I feel like I've changed my opinion since I've been talking to you guys. <laughs> I think we agree about stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, this is true, but I mean, at the same time, we've the last time you were on here, we we did discuss a few things where 
you thought differently about stuff we brought up. So we we did I, did I change my opinion though? I don't think I did. I, mean, like, I accept that there are other opinions out there. They and you even want to. Oh, <laughs> he's trying to steal my catchphrase from me. <laughs> we live in a country where you're allowed to be wrong. I, I'm glad you're allowed to be wrong, Joel. Ah, uh, yes. My catchphrase. Well, one of many. <laughs> look, look at you reasserting your catchphrase's primacy. That's beautiful. Oh, it's okay. mine. <laughs> <laughs> but in, anyway, so so with the, with that in mind, we'll st we'll start with we'll start with the warrior and um the first. The first um, track that I have for the warrior is Archer. Ooh, a and bold first choice. Now, I do want I do want to make notice of something that Ar that um, any anytime somebody's using tra traditional b traditional bows or tra or thro or thrown we or um, if they specialize in if they specialize in um a in accuracy based ranged combat they're going to fall into then that then that's going to be under the purview of archer when it when it comes to being better at that um of course in 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 a lot of the games the big the big ability that's been that's been the core of archer is aim you know take take some take some time to take take some time to delay your action in order to get in order to get a more accurate shot um in a weird way, it kind of reminds me of the lock-on ability from Wild Arms. Yeah. And that's kind of the trade-off, right? Because, like, you, you have the advantage of range with Archer. So, like, the two things that classically balance that are the need to aim, uh, and so, you're, like, your strike is more influenceable by the environmental conditions, and also the need to track ammo. And I've seen games that totally ignore one or both of those. Uh, so it just leaves a lot of advantage for people like Archers. Um... For me, I think I think I think doing it. I think doing doing normal doing normal ammo tracking would be kind of pointless. Although special ammo tracking is certainly is certainly um, on the cards. But what? But I th I think the I think the thing with the archer, the real thing that they have to track in this regard is time. I, they yeah, they take more time to to influence their aim. Yeah. Oh. So is that something that's present in the legend system, or something that's present in the DNA of the class? Um, when it, this is this is something that's pre this that whole that whole thing with ti with time that is that is me inter that is me interpreting the aim the aim ability that. Um, archers have ha in. have had in the in the games into the setup that we're creating here. That makes and I, sense, and and you're and you're right. In those games, the tactical trade off because like range doesn't really matter super much except maybe in Final Fantasy Tactics, but like but time matters because they remove positioning as an element you have to consider. So ranged combat suddenly it, it means something different. Mm -hmm. So the distinguishing thing between them and a fighter is that they can do this trade-off where it takes them longer to attack, but they're getting, like, critical damage, which is really significant. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's a valid approach. Generally, aimed So, the, the, approach that, the approach that I'm considering is first circle, they get aim as a, as a um, command. And the, circle, the subsequent circles are, about, are all about expanding what sort of aim effects they can put on, they can put on the aim action itself. Whether it be whether it be increased damage, higher chance higher chance for critical, um, de dealing 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 damage to multiple targets, what ha what have you, and the capstone of this sort of thing would be the ability to place two aim effects in the same action. Instead of doing like an aim and fire in the same action, you would just do double payoff as the capstone. Yeah. Interesting. So why not why not speed it up instead and make the ultimate archer the one that's like this fluid shoot master? Because like those, I think it's a I think your interpretation is totally awesome because like being able to focus on two distinct things is is kind of like a legendary thing, right? A legendary archer would be able to do that. 
Uh, and so it's totally valid. But why that instead of just mushing it down and saying you can aim as a free action or something like that? Here, here's the here's the approach that I'm going with the with the aim at with the aim action. Um, you're cho you're choosing you're choosing to you're choosing to delay your you're choosing to um, delay an attack action until the very end of the initiative count. But in doing so, you can put on an additional effect. Some and to the to the to that to that, at, to that particular attack, whether it be whether it be increased accuracy, increased damage, increased ch increased chance of crit increased chance of critical. The key thing the key thing is with this aim action, you can o up until you reach the capstone, you have to choose one effect to put to put on aim. With the capstone, you could you could do t you could do two effects, which oh I guess you're putting more tags on it then yeah or tag okay. two things. Is it tag two things or is it tag one thing with two different effects? Um, you're putting two you're putting two different effects period on aim. Some of some of the potential effects might be to allow to allow you to attack a one target and then t and then another one in say a ch and say a chain lightning effect. Okay. Damn it. So okay, structurally in combat in in the sort of three o three five pathfindery paradigm that that this combat exists in, there are versions of initiative where it becomes static after the first turn. So going last is actually not significant unless only the first round matters. So in circumstances like that, what is the trade-off for aim? Or is this a thing where we're like consistently rolling initiative and you're consistently taking the disadvantage of going last? Um when it comes to the when it comes to the whole the whole thing the whole thing with go, with going le with um going last. Um mm -hmm. the big re the big reason I, I ended up going with this is because of the fact that I can't integrate the fast and the fast and slow action set up from Shadow of the Demon Lord, if I could do that, that this work? would be a like, lot. This would be a lot easier. Because that. How does that one work though? Like, what's 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 the fast and slow action paradigm? Shadow of the Demon Lord does not use a does not use the traditional initiative count. What it do, what it does is um. Is it is at the at the start of the round, everybody declares whether they're taking a whether they're taking a fast or a slow action. If they're taking a fast action, they get then they get to act for then they get to act they get to act first with players getting the getting first crack when it comes to fast actions. If they take a slow action, then they have then they act last relatively. So you have a you have a case of two simultaneous phases instead. Okay, the the trade off then being is that if you don't act first, you might die before your turn. Yeah, I think that's less significant in a system where you can pile on a whole lot of hit points, though. Because it isn't Shadow of the Demon Lord pretty famously like you can get swept off in a single attack or just a, a very small number of attacks. Um, in in D and D, like you're much more resilient as a character than that. Like, again, classically. When it com when it comes when it comes to this particular again the 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 major that the major approach is is that I'm tr I'm trying to I'm trying to balance the ne the needs of the needs of both while still being stylistically um, apropos to apropos to it. That's what well, that's why I went that's why I went with um with some with something like um aim. It's not bad. Uh, it's just. I, again, I, I can't help but kind of see some of these these issues that might crop up. I've been playtesting for too long. That's why I'm being mm -hmm. such a contrarian here. Yeah. Uh, what, here. Here's one. Why not make it their entire standard action to aim? So they have to take that whole turn to do basically nothing, and then the next turn they get the tagged effect. That uh, that I'd be perfectly fine with. Um, okay. Would have to make sure the tagged effect was better than getting two chances to hit them with just a normal bow and arrow. But I feel like I don't think that'd be too hard to do, mm -hmm. depending on how how you uh, choose to tweak it. Yeah. Um, next is barbarian, which there's te the yeah. the funny thing is is that um, there's technically a bar there's technically a barbarian a barbarian class already in legend, so half of the work is done. And when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to this particular track, this is all about rages. 
Well, <laughs> and didn't we also determine that uh, other classes with different names and motifs but the same type of actions were grouped in? Things like pirate. Yeah. A pirate. I think Viking came up uh, in mm -hmm. the initial discussion of this, which is just basically like, again, it's one of those things in Final Fantasy where it's a fighter, but the art is different, you know? The art is different, and they have their own set of skills, like, again, rages or whatever they do to get extra damage. I feel like that that's enough. If they um, have something like like a rage, I think that's... Because in D&D, &D, that's mechanically distinct enough for them to not just be a kind of fighter. Like, they're their own thing in D&D. &D. They're their own thing in Legends. I, I feel like that's that's reasonably distinct enough. If it's yeah. just a reflavored fighter, then yes. If it's a reflavored fighter that's so reflavored that they have a unique strategic optimal optimality... Then I think that we can make its own class or its um, own track at least. Yeah, and w now the next one is dervish, which um, the appro the approach to something like this is I can I can in um, legend dervish is rage and rage is split is split bet rage is split between two um, forms. I think it was like I think it was like um, fury and dervish. The former is the traditional approach, which is very strength based. Dervish is dex based. So for people who Dervish want to do, is good. It's for people who wanted who want to who want to do more dex style bi style builds, but not but still but still have the rage element. In this case it's kind of like a, a different version of what's what I might call a combat trance. You know, where where like you're entering this other state where there's a dis distinct trade off between your broader options and your capabilities in combat. And so, so my question is like taking this back, like clearly the barbarian in Final Fantasy and the barbarian in the Legend system, like they 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 feel slightly different tactical niches for different reasons. Mm -hmm. So where's where do you reconcile those? I'm interested in that, Mildred. Um. The approach, the approach that the approach that I that that I would that I would take, is um. The bar is the barbarian end of end of the situation. Um, is again is very is very um is very strength based. The one of the one of the approaches that that I'd prob that I'd probably take is, while is, take is taking a taking a cue from an effect I from the um. From an effect I like from the from a um, fighter maneuver that I liked in Thirteenth Age, where every time every time that every time that they and this where um they end up they end up gradually be having a better chance at hit better chance at hitting until they hit and then it resets, which could which is one of those things that could go either way. But the appro the overall theme that I wanted to go with is a barbarian's battle trance is. Str is strength and raw power based, whereas a dervish's um, battle trance is is pure, is more um, more speed and agility based. So they so the latter would the latter would get would get boosts to movement, get bo get boosts to um d to the ability to dodge to the to um po to possibly being able to attack mu attack multiple times. And the in the to say, turn. yeah, extra attack effects. Mm -hmm. I was going to say. Hmm. So what's the drawback to Dervish then? Because because classically the 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 D and D barbarian rage sacrifices your armor class and defense for increased ability to hit and damage. Mm -hmm. Like as I recall, um, um, but with the Dervish, if you're increasing dexterity, that is the effect of increasing your uh, your defense. I guess my question the, is, what's the trade-off well, going to a trance with the, the dervish? The, the funny thing, of, the funny thing about that is, um, because is something in something in Legends class design, the offensive and defensive ability modifiers are not exactly set in stone. Each each class has what's referred to as a KOM and a KDM. I remember that. Yeah, I was uh, I was looking through that. So okay. So is it the case that in both of them, when you're entering a combat trance, you basically get like comparable powers, where you're getting more offense and defensive capability in both cases? They just it's strength based versus dexterity based. Yeah, 
the the key th the key thing that I would probably do is um, dervishes have a higher have a higher chance to get it get are going to be getting boosts to their chance to hit but not damage and vice versa for barbarians in this particular trance. That's interesting. Higher damage versus higher to hit. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's interesting it makes them more reliable instead of uh, deadlier necessarily. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. now, One's oh, more consistent, the other's crit fishing. Yeah. Yeah, crit fishing. I like that. And actually, that gives them very distinct tactical roles, too, because it, it kind of takes one closer to the DPS path. You know? mm -hmm. And the other guy is, is more of like um, a bit more of a high roller kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, I mean, they're still really distinct kind of tactical niches. So, so okay, so what's the trade off then? Going I would into these combat trances. Um, I would I would say that I would say that the I would say the tra the trait in um obviously in D and D the tra the trade off is um is fatigue. I w the trade off that the trade off that I'm considering going with um taking a taking a cue from fantasy craft is that for e each round af each round after the first your um. Your f your fumble range goes up by one. Is that like a critical failure kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. It's more of a more of a risk based thing in both cases. Then, as you just like get like kind of sloppier as you go on. Mm-hmm. Because you're okay. getting tired. And what one and if you f if you fumble while in trance, you're out. Uh, you're out of it, and you're and you can't you can't use it again for the rest of the encounter. Does that, okay, so does that actually give you a lingering disadvantage like exhaustion does, or is it just that you go back to just basically being a fighter with no special tricks now? It's pretty. It's pretty much the latter. the The reason why I went with this approach is that the the lingering the lingering disadvantages I felt were a, I felt for the bonuses that you get from raging were far too punishing. I mean, that's part of the element of it, though. You know? Yeah, but you don't see that same type to... of thing. I, th so... I think the, the big thing here is that since we are doing this with Final Fantasy classes, those types of same lingering disadvantages you see in in tabletop don't normally occur in Final Fantasy classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, again, I, I know that the, the trans... The, transition well, from the question i have then for that is uh, what does the final fantasy barbarian do then like what's its trade-off it, within the context of those games the um it go ahead it's slower in the games and it can't uh it can't wear some of the better armors so it just gets hit and takes more damage usually mm -hmm. while it's using its rages yeah we're not taking that disadvantage. I feel like we're being consistent trying to port over Final Fantasy. We should we should say that your armor is less effective or something. Your defenses go down whenever you're in a dervish or rage state. But wouldn't that translate it better? Because you're right. It, it, in in that way, it's it really is a mode you can enter where you're just kind of swapping out uh, defense for better offense, which seems to be the role they play in Final Fantasy. And that way, you don't have to worry about like ongoing status effects. Which you're right; those are a little more of a D and D kind of way of approaching it. The it, the the reason why the reason why I didn't is be, is is simply is simply because of the fact that, that um I I need I need to prop I need to properly scale that not scale that um pen, scale that penalty and as far as far as as far as the whole thing with the armors that's not going to fly simply because of the simply because of how simplified legend system is with its armor yeah certainly there's still numbers that could be reduced though just go just going with the reduction of numbers is not interesting to me but it i mean it, that element of it isn't necessarily interesting but the trade-off is interesting and, and again the kind of people that would select this class like they would be the kind that would be attracted to that exact trade-off yeah. I'm I'm more okay. in, I'm more interested in make I'm more interested in making it high risk high re, high risk high reward re, rather than rather than a yin, rather than a yin yang I have plans for that for um, other affairs. But, but there's no risk though. You're a normal fighter who can get huge bonuses until you suddenly and randomly stop getting them 
then you return to being a normal fighter. There is there's, zero risk. There's one. That. There's one other thing. You're, there's one other thing you're forgetting in in this regard, um, Joel. Each of each, Archer, Barbarian, Dervish, so on. Those are one track of seven class features. A starting in every starting character is going to have at least three tracks. But even considering that. The we, we that doesn't like really change the the foundational cornerstone of my argument because the archer has a trade off in the action economy. They have to sacrifice an action, the speed of the action, for a bonus. What are these guys sacrificing for their bonus? There's nothing materially. They should either have to sacrifice defense, or they should enter in a fatigue state or something. There's something should be a trade off, even if that is merely moving numbers. Like, what else are we doing here? This, these the, are effectively D&D &D classes. Numbers are going to get moved. That might not be enormously creative, but it is at least consistent. In the only the the only um the only one I'm cons I'm considering is is to is to add an extra di add an extra um damage die when they take hits. Yeah, that'd be fine. Uh, and effectively, that is still moving numbers, but it is. And it actually, I kind of like that one better than just, just dropping the defense. Because when you think about it, that's more consistent with the high-risk, high-reward approach you're doing. Because now, if they get hit, now they take more damage. Mm -hmm. Just like if they hit, they deal out more damage. That's actually almost perfect. Um, yeah, I next, really like that one. Yeah, I, next, I vote for that one. Next is, well, next is a, one of my favorite classes to the point that I, that I used it in one, of my, in one of my old email addresses. Dragoons. <laughs> I uh, love dragoons. Oh, Kane, I love you. Continue. Oh, dragoons, the tanks of the floor. <laughs> anyone who plays, uh, anyone who plays Final Fantasy XIV will know about tanking the floor as a dragoon. Okay. I feel th I feel that if I feel that if there's any if there's any analog to dr to dragoons, so you can kind of get it feel about what I'd want to do with it. Consider the consider the assault marine in a um in a space marine kill squad. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm these are these are these are a dragoon is going to is going to is going to excel in the hit and run, in the hit and run tactic. He's gonna jump in, stab you, and jump out. Bye bye. A bit. Hit and I'd say a combination of hit and run and um, and area control. Don't forget, they're also probably a bit of shock trooper in there. I think anybody would be scared shitless when somebody comes from the sky to impale the guy next to them. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously one of obviously one of the primary commands that's going that's going to be working is jump. And when it comes to when it comes to this when it comes to this, it's we are doing the whole um, action. We are doing the whole action, the whole time economy thing, just a little bit more extreme. Where they, where um, they are, com they are completely. Uh, once they're in the air, they are completely outside the outside the battlefield, and they can and they cannot be touched positively or negatively until they come down. Yeah, they can't be healed. They can't be killed. It's just like fly in Pokemon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or jump in the older games. Yeah. I would like to point out that that does mean that we are abstracting everything above a certain like height range in the battlefield as yeah. being kind of like not really part of the game. Era Lost Legend did thing. this did this exact thing, and I should know. I was playing a la I was playing a lancer in that in that campaign that I did that I did with its creator, and there, and even though so we were indoors, I could still get away with using jump. So uh we're going what we're going to actually assume is jump just puts you on a parallel sub universe <laughs> and you're above the battlefield until you jump down from said parallel sub universe at rapid speed. Yes. You know honestly, I'm fine with that approach, but I'm equally <laughs> and I like to point out equally fine with the approach that you really can just jump super high because think about this. There are already rules for falling in D&D &D, and actually pretty good rules. And you could there's there's rules for flight, there's rules for fast movement. You really could just say, nah, motherfucker, you can just jump. And if that means you can jump super high, cool. You're mostly in a dungeon, so it's not always relevant. But when it is, it's awesome. And all you have to do is transfer the dice you would take from falling damage onto your foe. 
it's really clean. Um, and it gives you the cool ability to jump super high. Even with nothing else in that class, I am in love with that. It's um, so eloquent. I really love it. I'm not. I'm not entire. I'm not entirely thrilled with the idea of, of digging of digging around to de to determine how much fall damage would how much fall damage would be would be transferred over in that case. I think it's D6 per yard or something like that. But I mean, you can even match the height you could jump to the amount of damage. It matches cleanly already as a function of the rules as written. And, and I, I'm, again, I'm, I love this. In three O and three five and three five and now in three uh, in five E, as far as I know, because uh, I didn't play fourth, uh, I never got a chance to. Um, well, it's, you'd like it. It's good. Fall damage and push damage were the same, um, and it was D six per square traveled, yeah. up to a maximum of something like six D six because you hit terminal velocity or whatever. I, I feel like the dragoon could push that. The Beyond Dragoon could just do D6 per square traveled, which is every five feet. And if you jump 400 feet in the air, that's a... That, that's, that's the other, that's the <laughs> other reason why, why, I'm hes why I'm hesitant to have that. I would, I would much rather it be, I would much rather it be a, it be a set, it be a set amount of damage. But the other thing that I'd have, that I'd have them focus on, and this is the reason why I, why I mentioned area control, is I see, I see that, I see them for... I see them as being able to take advantage of pushing, of of for of forced movement, and the and the possibility of making it of making it very difficult to be in melee with them. Considering they're all wielding fucking lances, mm -hmm. battle lances. Not so for those of you out there who don't know, lances were not only held on horseback. There are lances that were used as very large, heavy spears in combat. I think the most famous of which is the nine foot spear. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're 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 holding giant fuck off lances. You don't get within ten feet of these fuckers. They stab you before you can. Yeah. And what? And because because of that, one one of the things I'm I'm considering at um, as a mid as a mid tier effect of theirs is is a um. There are cer there are certain um there are certain stance effects in um fantasy craft where a where some where somebody has where you're given a you're given a kind of de you're given a kind of um defa default attack when somebody tries to move within melee range and if or rather a def rather a uh, DC that they have to go over and if they don't go over then you g then you get to make a attack of opportunity against them for free. And, and the attack opportunity in Threatened Squares is pretty well laid down in most versions of D&D &D, uh, from third onward, too. So I, th I think that, and uh, like the normal spear rules already kind of intersect with that. You really could do a lot riffing off of it. I think yeah. there, there's a lot of room for it. Um, next is Fencer, which I consider, I consider, fe I consider Fencer to, one, be a very, um, a very single target focus type, type of, type of approach in fact i'd probably have it that they have a challenge they have um some version of the marking rules that um kit that certain that striker um classes had in fourth edition yeah that's actually i think that's really consistent with how they would work but also that th that that this is that um they they would um they would be they would be a, they would be a case they would be a more literal case of a crit fisher, where they could they could take the opportunity to to um sacrifice damage or sa sacrifice damage if they didn't if they hit normally in exchange for getting a higher crit range. Yeah, and and honestly, the uh, the the crit range enhancers and the crit fighters were a build uh, in three zero and three five, so. Mm -hmm. You, you could just do a lot by uh, like streamlining and codifying that a little bit and putting it on the track system. And, and really, I feel like you get a pretty satisfying fencer because what are they but like a fighter who you know is super good at stabbing the, the weakest organ you can find? Yep. Um, no. fen fencers in general, when you usually see them, have some sort of uh, um, special attacks that do like physical defense down sometimes but they don't have like the oh, crush yeah. attacks that actually like break armor and stuff which brings um, which brings me to the next one the knight 
All yeah. of the brakes. <laughs> All of uh, the yes. brakes. Okay, so he, there's a there's a there's a funny thing about night. Um, when we were discussing bravely default classes, the pirate in this case is the knight. It has the same ultra damage of a barbarian. Except all that ultra damage is tied to its skills, and it has all of the crush skills in the game. Like, all of them. Um, so, yes, the knight doing all of your... This is this is Steiner, by the way, guys. This is all Steiner. Mm -hmm. You want your knight? There's Steiner right there. Yep. Um, also a bit of Auron, because his part of the sphere grid also had a lot of the um, ability breaks. Yeah, but I put Orin more in mm -hmm. samurai. Um, it there is his his overdrives are, his overdrives are certainly named after a bunch of samurai drawouts, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The knights, <laughs> um, eat, I'm thinking each each circle you you pick from a pool you pick from a pool of um br of break abilities. Now. Because of the fact that these break abilities are pro are are tar are targeting stats directly, this does bring the question of of um of the crunch of the crunchiness because t because say say do doing doing a break that would put that would put a minus two pen penalty to um strength that's that's a little bit too cr that's a little bit too crunchy. I've never been a fan of ability drain or ability penalties in that direct. Um, it's fashion a penalty of births, honestly. That's interesting. The approach. I mean, like uh, the approach. Well that trod ground, you know. I, I'm, I'm just saying, like, it, I, you you seem to be preferentially deprioritizing it. You just you don't like them, and so like they just kind of get pushed off the table. Um, but like, doesn't it make sense that you could hit someone really hard, like on their shoulders and arms, and they'd be able to fight less effectively? Like that that scans, right? The I'm t I'm ac I was actually getting to that. All right, let's hear it. The approach the approach that I'm taking is that they are they're inflict they're inflicted by a break st that that particular um, target is inflicted by a break status effect. The that status effect puts a cap on their dice rolls, um, as, so long so long as it's in effect. So instead instead of a instead of a instead of a um, say a minus two modifier to the, to their strength score. They cannot roll higher than an eighteen. Mm, interesting. So if, if they so if they were to roll a nineteen on on a on a strength check, it's treated as an eighteen. And and uh, the reason we're a bit penalty averse, I guess the best way to put it, uh, is just outright changing a number is a little less interesting. We want to mix it up a little bit. I know that. Sometimes changing the numbers is the only, the only path to I go mean, for what, that makes sense. What are we doing if not changing numbers and interacting with the action economy? Like those are really the two core things we're doing here. The reason, like, the reason so I the most, went, the, the most reason thing to me would be if you had a status effect like Mildred was talking about. Mm -hmm. Like that's a unique status effect. This whole yeah. capping their range thing that's neat. Mm -hmm. But like yeah. there's status effects in fifth edition too, which which effectively just move numbers around. But the fluff of them gives you something to kind of role play towards. Uh, and I think that's a valid design space too. That might it's a little bit light for my taste. I'd prefer there to be more descriptive action restrictions. I, f I find. But, I mean, I'm also. I find that um, I find that pe I've, I could I I'm tempted to go into how I how I find that I find that some some people who some people who write a, who write about this kind of thing, um, end up using end up using um, role playing as a bit as a bit of a, a bit of a bit of a cr a bit of a crutch in some regards. But that, but I'm, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Back, back on the rails. Like I said, night is all. Night is all about the the um break effects. Um, I I'd, will break you. I'd I'd argue <laughs> I'd argue that um that eat that um the effectiveness of the of them is de is determined by how 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 many circles you've unlocked. So in or in order to make it so that the um. That whatever break ability you unlocked at first circle is still going to be effective once you're once you're in the late teens. So they kind of scale with the class. Yeah. A lot Otherwise, there'd like be that. no reason to pick them. Yeah. Um. Now, 
when it comes to when it comes to monk um <laughs> i am i am take i because i am taking most of my cues with monk in this regard from um fi from final fantasy 14's cycles specific specifically ah. the the ho the holy st the holy stance trinity you know where i'm going with this would you would you care to um give would you care to give the audience the skinny on the way the monk works in 14 all right so in 14 the monk has a rotation a very simple rotation at first that puts them in a fighting stance that gives them an extra a, a small tiny extra ability for the move they're about to use and that next move that they use moves them into the next stance and it, as you go between this you get stacks of the monks I, I would call it its class feature at first mm -hmm. the uh, grease lightning ability yes that makes makes your cooldowns shorter makes your attacks the attack animations even faster and you start doing more damage mm -hmm. um there's a bunch of off cooldown stuff you can weave in later that also does more stuff based on the stance you're in so when it comes to the monk the stance you're in is just as important as moving to the next stance for your off cooldowns. So in this, I imagine Monk's going to have... You're moving between the stances as you fight, and then you can use a specific skill at a specific time, depending on the stance and where you are in the count of your stance changes. Yeah. In this, re in this regard, this is one of those cases where I'm lifting the, um, I'm lifting the combat flow of the Monk from 13th Age. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that at, at each circle you're unlo you're unlocking a you're unlocking a new the w the way it works in 13th age is that you have um you have in you have um three you have three types of unarmed attacks jab punch and kick each um doing d doing um d6 d8 and d10 damage respectively the approach the approach that I'm go that I'm going and and um, with this is that for e for each um each cir each circle you get to, you get to unlock one tr one trinity of this th of this three step setup as well as well a as well as the um well I'll get I'll get to the grease lightning eff effect in a moment um the the as the reason I'm taking this approach is that as you as you love as you um as you get more um as you get more rotations the rotations aren't in a aren't in a set path. It is, oh, it is opening, flow, finish. But it but you go you can pick any of your openings, to go to any of your flows, to go to any of your finishes. So because of that, the more um, the more rotations that you have, the more varied combinations you can do. The only problem is if you miss, mm -hmm. uh, you'd have to start over. You'd yeah. have to start over the the rotation, and your greased lightning would stop. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only way you could balance it in a TTRPG. Yeah, and as as far as as far as how as far as how greased lightning would work, I'd uh, I'd argue th I'd argue that you sh that you sh that it should be giving you for starters um a a um higher in a higher initiative e at each um stack and and some. S and some slight bo some slight boosts to um to a I'd say it I'd say attack it would you say it should get bo it should be boosting attack or boosting damage I would say it would be accuracy so attack mm -hmm. it, I I in the end I think the da whatever damage uh modifiers you're going to give the monk are going to come off of the uh off rotation abilities that can only occur during an opening or during yeah. a flow and 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 I also um, the other sacrifice that a monk is going to need to make, even in the art on 14, which doesn't usually affect the stats, but if you look at what monks wear across all of Final Fantasy, it's cloth. Mm -hmm. They don't wear armor. Yeah. So that's the big one. If you take monk, you're going to get this really cool class that can do this really cool rotation and have some really awesome stuff. But if you ever drop the combo for any reason or get hit uh you're a going to lose the combo have to start from zero and b you're not going to be very happy because you're going to be taking some fd damage um 
as as far as as far as the now one of the other, in the expansions one of the other sub effects that monks had was um, chakra, and truth be told I'm actually con I am actively considering um, combining greased lightning with um, chakra, so that you could spend the stacks to do a chakra effect. Yeah, instead of ha instead of having them be two instead of having them be two separate things. That would make sense. It would also you make for designed the. Uh... It feels like you inadvertently designed the fifth edition monk. Like that's that's Actually, exactly how they work. Um, not <laughs> like not really. Like I said, so I'm taking like, I'm okay, taking my cues from the thirteenth age monk. Oh, which... and thirteenth age is a fantastic game too. It, it's it's interesting though because like MMOs, like, especially the Final Fantasy MMOs, are so based on like this this iterative Final Fantasy franchise, and like when you core down Final Fantasy. To the very first one, it's very D and D. It's very like fighter it's, mage thief. You know? It's it's very D and D, but weird. not but not beca but but that's a that's a consequence of its influences but, more than well, more than a. It is, but I mean, like it, it, it's fascinating because like we have this sort of two directional thing where D and D begets Final Fantasy in a lot of critical ways, and then eventually. It, the, whatever MMOs finally emerge from that morass of the more traditional kind of like the, the electronic RPGs, they sort of backwash back into stuff like Fourth Edition and Thirteenth Age. And now there's all these ideas from this very different kind of play and design paradigm that are influencing RPGs. And I think that's kind of beautiful. And I was sort of ruminating on that while you guys were talking. Yeah, I just want to interject it into the conversation. I've, I've seen I've seen some people cry foul about that about that kind of thing because oh, because not, um you should never you should never cry foul about games influencing each other. They all do. Well, in the early in the early two thousands, there was there was this at there was this um. Attitude and belief that you that um you should that you should not be t that um you should not be taking any inspiration from um from video games or anime. That's why I, that's why I always bring up the tone the um book of Weeaboo Fight and Magic because that was at the um <laughs> that was at the that was at the well, apex or that. or nadir of, of this particular magic, yeah or of this particular um debate. Um, now next is the samurai, and this is an. There's two. There's um. This is an. This is another another instance where um where there's a, there's a couple ways to take it. And truth be told, the tr the traditional um draw out approach, I'm less inclined to utilize simply because of the fact that it's going to be a hard sell to. To convince pe to convince players to use this powerful ability, but you break your weapon. Is that how it works in Final Fantasy? Did their weapons break more commonly? Yeah. Um, Depends on the game. Yeah. The whole idea with draw out is your is your is your calling out the kami within the sword. And. Interesting. I feel like there's ways to manifest that that doesn't break the sword, <laughs> you know. Um, some of now some uh, some interpretations have been that have been that it ex that it um, exhausts the sword and you're and you're at a significant disadvantage when you do it. But even then, I've um, even then it still feels a bit too much like a like a win button to really to not a not a win button but just um just too much of a um, too much of a system that's going to be that's going to fall into the um. Rainy day paradox, as I've called it. It's the rainy day paradox. I'm I'm curious now. That the... you need something for a rainy day, but you'll never use it because the rain the day that's rainy is never rainy enough for you to justify it. Oh oh okay yeah mm -hmm. the, uh, the the but I've also heard called the the ether ether paradox. I've only got 99 of them. You can't buy them in a store. And or like, I'm in the last battle. I need a, a, a MP, and I'm still not using the damn things. Mm -hmm. Or my favorite version of it. Um. I watch a Let's Player H.C. Bailey. Uh, his whole thing is mega elixirs, uh, you know, mega potions, things like that are in the too good to use club. Because yeah, they're too rare and too useful. Even if he has 99 and has sold stacks of 70 twice now in the FF15 playthrough he's on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and I there's something about being risk averse, just like the way the human nature operates that, yeah. 
the rainy day paradox is a real phenomenon. Uh, it's it's that, not just in in that case. So. That's fallacy. Actually, yeah. That's that's the reason why in um in a game like Thief, I actually appreciate the fact that you can't carry over items from one stage to the next. Yeah, yeah, because it's a use it or lose it thing. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, the, yeah, and because because of that, you actually because of that, it also means you have an incentive to try and to try and loot as much gold as you can. <laughs> instead of what instead of what the um, what the mission requires um it's really good design i like unless that. unless it unless you're run, unless you're running through the thieves guild in which mm, i'm not the longest sewer level ever <laughs> <laughs> moving right along but i do think that the I do think that the that the samurai that the samurai class in fourteen has a a um interesting uh, al an interesting alternative with the combination of Kenki and Sen. Okay, yeah. Uh, so essentially, Kenki is something that builds up doing specific attacks within the the um within the normal combo, mm -hmm. and as Kenki builds up, you can use Kenki moves. The Kenki moves then have an outcome that gives you one of three Sen. When you have the Sen from one to three, uh, you can do specific super moves, which everybody saves up for the three Sen move because it, back when it first came out during Stormblood, did the absolute biggest damage number ever seen. And uh, everybody likes that big dick energy. I'm just mm -hmm. going to say it. Now, I d I d when, it com when it comes to... We do have a, we do have a instance of escalation, and I do in this particular setup. I am I am very I am very much in favor of, fi of finding a way to integrate um, Kenki and Sen. Um, the uh, the approach the approach the, the approach that I that I'm cons that I'm considering with this is well for for one. Um, I do, I do, th I do think that much like the monk, it should be a case where they, where, um, where it, where they end up, t where if they, if they, um, f if they end up losing focus, or they end up, get, they end up getting hit or so or something like that, then they, then they're gonna end up taking penalties, but not as, not as badly. Um, the the approach, the the approach that, that I that I'm considering is. You get is um. You get you get you um. You at each at each um circle, you're getting you're getting a man, you're getting maneuvers to um, to in to in to increase um, to that that allow you to increase the this particular um Ken key pool. Um. And actually now now that I think about it. Would it be would it be a bet would it be a better move to have um to have sen to have the three the three sends as stances? You'd still have to have a way to make it gated that to move into that stance, oh. and then you'd have to attack from that stance to move into the next stance. Well, and is this happening over multiple turns? Like the, the action economy in in a in a MMO, or MMO is so distinct from the action economy in like a TTRPG when it comes to fighting. How how about it, how about this? It's hard to translate them really cleanly. How how about how about this? Um, when ma when when make when make when making a, when making attacks. Any t any time any time that you I'm thinking of taking the um the the approach that I ki I kind of referenced with you Zan when out when we were doing this with um with Monster Hunter where the where um you can re you can reduce you can re you can reduce the de let's let's go with this you can re you can reduce the de you can reduce the damage die from an, from an attack it, because any time any time that you roll a any time that you roll a one, let's say you get let's say you, that counts as a that counts as a point of Kenki. 
you can then you can then you you can then use those to at those points towards um towards the sen effects. Um. So uh, at at the core function of this, is it just like you're building up to your special attacks? Yes. Is that what's it's it's in that way kind of similar to the the limit break when you think about it. This is sort of the inverse of it. Mm -hmm. Um. Actually. The um, that's that's the approach that's the approach that I'm considering with the samurai, and ad admittedly, the um, s the samurai is going to be a tough nut to crack no matter what. Well, I mean, it really depends on the samurai you're talking about, because different different Final Fantasies are very different versions of the samurai. Because I mean, it's a, it's a rich mythology, the mm -hmm. samurai mythology. There's lots of stuff with it, and it's not like these games aren't from Japan, where those those myths are well known. Uh, so yeah, it. it there's a lot of different ways you go about doing samurai. I I will I will admit that one of the reasons I I was considering going with um, sen as stances is be is because is because of a, because of a certain stormblood um, character who was a bit of a was a bit of a sword collector and used sen as stances when he appeared in Dissidia. Oh. Why did you have to reference him? Because because I'm a holist. Of course you are. Um, the Sentinel, however, however, is is going to be is going to be a little straightforward. Break out the steel guard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say the I'd say the the Sentinel class is going to is going to be. F the Sentinel um, track is for people who want to lean into the classically tanky approach. Um, and so something I'm, something I'm considering taking is that they um, that up up to a certain up to a certain point, every time that an attack misses them, they get da they get um, damage resistance, which stacks up to a point. Of course, when they get hit, and that when they actually get hit, that th that um resets. That's interesting. So I, I guess I don't know. When I think about something like that, I always think like, what is the role that it plays tactically? Like, how does that manifest when you're playing it? And the it's interesting that this class is. What well, it's continuing with the thought. It's interesting that this class. Instead of it being, I'm rolling a die and hoping for a success, it's my enemy is rolling a die, and I'm hoping for them to fail. Mm -hmm. That's interesting design space, actually. Yeah. Kind of intriguing, Mill. Um, of, co of course, of course, you also have the possibility of using interrupts so that, so that they have to hit you. Um, especially when it comes to range attacks. And I will admit that that kind of thing is coming to mind... Primarily because of, um, sorry, just a big ass bug just flew just flew in. <laughs> if it keeps missing you, your armor will build. So yeah, but like in order to make sure that 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 it does that um that somebody who builds up their armor isn't isn't in the isn't in the words of our favorite me our favorite meme lord from revengeance fucking invincible when you do get hit <laughs> even if you take even if you take minimal damage the um dr resets and i would say that that dr is still t is still um ca is, the amount of potential dr you can get is still going to be um capped based on your highest circle Makes sense. Uh, remembering that DR effectively is the same thing as giving additional hit points. You get right down to it. Uh, it's stronger. Like the the amount of hit points to DR conversion isn't exact, uh, but like it's it's considerably stronger than more hit points. It, it can be effectively considerably more hit points depending on how much DR it is. Yeah. So I think you're wise to be careful with DR uh, because of how much it changes the value of attacks. Mm -hmm. Um, and the the last one in the warrior entry is Swordmaster, which um, in the in Returner's third edition, Swordmaster was ba was basically their their way to try and to try and integrate attacks that referenced 
um, several characters' limit breaks. Um, I would say I would say that so, I would say in this case, Swordmaster would be for the um, stance-based characters. I feel like I feel like that would be a bit I feel like that would be a bit more appropriate. What does it do though? Um the the idea is that they that they get a set of stances that they can that they can activate that are effectively um exclusive status effects for them that have their that have their own um advantages and disadvantages. Like it might it might mm -hmm. it might give a might give a boost to attack at the at the cost of damage. Might give a boost to initiative, at the co at um at the co at the cost of attack. Some something akin to that. Okay, so it seems like they're doing the, the same kind of trade off like the uh, the barbarian was, where they're switching uh, one advantage for a disadvantage. They just have like yeah. a broader range. The the um the, the different the difference in this case with when it comes to them is that their stances are are, are would be a lot more versatile. Yeah, it sounds like they can do a lot more with it. So so I guess my question is since I have those two classes even categorically like they're in the same category under warrior, right? Mm -hmm. Why would I choose barbarian over these guys? It seems like these guys can just do a lot more. Like they they've got more of the same gimmick. Um I would I would say I would say the re the reason the reason why you would ch why you would choose bar why you would have barbarian as a track instead it is is the fact that sort the 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 ones that sword swordmaster is is a case of is a case of versatility without a whole lot of um stacking mm, and the barbarian's gonna have a more intense but more focused version yeah okay that makes sense um. Swordmaster is that it would be for would would be for people who want to um want who want a bit of diver diversification in their in that setup. It sounds like they're especially if we're doing kind of a because it, there's different ways to go about like TTRPG combat. Some of them are very like board gamey and grid based, and some of them are a little more like open and descriptive. Uh, and especially in the second one, I feel like these guys would shine because like whenever the tactical option of being able to descriptively alter the the scenario like opens up to something you can you can do having a lot of situationally applicable things the value of that rises dramatically yeah. because like you know maybe the gm didn't think he was going to need to make mechanics for climbing the tree that he described in the scene but in a in a game like old school dnd that's totally on the table trees are climbable it's just an element of reality Whereas in something like 4th edition, which is a little more grid-based, there would already be an existing mechanic for putting a tree in a game, and you would either be able to have access to that or not. Um, and yeah, so I, I like that. I actually like the, 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 the trade-off of versatility for focus. The reason, the reason why... And of, of, course, the, of course, there's nothing stopping from someone, from someone taking both Dervish and, um, so, and Swordmaster, for that's instance. That's a good point, actually. That's... The, <laughs> the, the, thing, the thing with... Like the, if Go ahead. Go ahead. You first. The thing, the thing with it, with it is that even though all these we've mentioned are from Warrior, you're only picking three for your um for your um three tracks or four if you're going with the full buy-in method. Yeah, and and the the big thing is you don't even have to pick all three from the Warrior track. They you can blend too. You can blend um, with specific skills and specific uh, sacrifices. I know that Monk and I were talking about, it and he said the first track swap out could be for free. The first track out is f the first swap out is free. You get a yeah. You if you if that's still not enough, you can take the guild initiation feat at first level and get an additional swap. Yeah, and so you could, if you really wanted to, you could take Swordmaster for the versatility, and then say. Something on independent catches your catches your uh, eye, like uh, let's say Chocobo Knight, mm -hmm. which we'll, when we get to that, it's it's pretty self explanatory, but we'll get to it. Yeah. Um, and then let's say you also also wanted some some skill monkey to throw in there, so you pick up Thief from Expert. You could totally do that, and then mm -hmm. let's say you wanted to go full buy in because you're just like I just don't feel like I'm gonna hit enough, and so you pick up maybe uh, Dragoon. Hmm. As well, on top of it, and all of a sudden, you're a Swordmaster Chocobo, Chocobo Knight Thief Dragoon. 
I don't know what we would actually call that, but those are your four tracks. And uh, I honestly feel like that's a good enough name. <laughs> <laughs> Sword Master Chocobo Night Thief Dragoon. <laughs> I mean, stringing together class names from Final Fantasy is going to sound ridiculous. Let's let's let's. let's as an aside, let's try another one. Geomancer, Scholar, Gunner, Fencer. I, that sounds like an awesome dude, though. I mean, like, if that was my <laughs> official title, I'd feel pretty badass. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, when it, com- when it comes to... The first one that we have when it comes to Expert is Bard. And the, the reason why I put Bard in, ec- in Expert and not Warrior, because of the fact that they're, that they're the evolution of Archers in um, 14, is... The bar the bard is focused solely on the the bard in this case is focused on focused solely on their singing. That's that's what you get if you ch- if you pick the bard track. And thus the bard track also includes other similar tracks such as performer from Bravely Default and dancer from Final Fantasy XI. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's wise. I, and I think Sing is a, a pretty nifty command, even when it uh, crops up in Final Fantasy. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I like that quite a bit, actually. So, so what does it do, though, in, in like TTRPG terms? It was kind of a strange ability, as I recall, whenever uh, it wound up in, it showed up in the games. Well, it, it's it's not a, what a, what Bard would what um, Bard's perform would would do is not is not all is not all that strange because. We'd effectively be doing what a bar- what a bard is supposed to be doing, but do- but doesn't beca- but doesn't because of design issues, namely basically, do- basically doing what a bard is supposed to be doing and not fucking dragons. Yes, um, I don't know what you think bards are supposed to be doing, but I'm not a prude with my bards. I can fuck whatever they want. <laughs> yes, but there are things that you need to do as your role in the party, and when you fuck go off the dragon. And when you go off fucking the dragon, you're not doing those roles, and your party is dying. The party, which is to fuck the dragon. Like I don't know where you think half dragons come from, but like a dragon fucking the... someone else, not someone fucking the dragon. Dragons are the dominant in that particular uh, dichotomy. You could get pregnant, or you can get pregnant from a dominant. I'm just saying that, like, okay, the rails. Is the party role. <laughs> anyway, the point is. You should fuck the, dragons with bards. You are so lucky that you're not that you're not within arm's reach with me with me right now, Joel. Are your if face Joel hadn't if Joel hadn't said it though, I would have. Yeah, no, come on, man. Fuck both of you. Um, <laughs> here's here's the here's the thing. The the fo- the focus to me is is all about them be- them um playing the playing support you know the the whether it be bard whether it be dancer they are they are giving they are giving some sort of they're focusing their their attention and their turns on on providing a on providing a buff to the party now admittedly i've talked about how my favorite version of bard in fantasy games is um is the bard in thirteenth age, because of the fact that they have an opening, maintain, and a and a final verse kind of um, setup. Um, the approach, the approach, to th- like that too. Um, the approach, th- the approach that I want that I want to go with is, th- is that they ha- that um they ha- they have they have a they have a kind of performs they have a kind of perform setup. However, however, um, should we should we have it that th- that their perform is akin to concentration, where th- in order for them to maintain it, they have to take that as their full round action? Mm, well, here's the thing. No, you, you really can uh, possibly no. But like, here's the thing: whenever you're putting up what is equal to what, you have to think of the trade off. They're trading off a normal standard attack for this is this the equivalent of a normal standard attack whether or not it's boosting up everyone else in the party such as that it makes up the difference and then some or it removes status effects or whatever mm-hmm. can you say that the value is equal to what they're sacrificing and if the answer is yes or it's greater then it's something that they would reasonably be able to choose and so it, it kind of has to remove their ability to attack yeah uh, if not that it should be an addition 
the, again, you'd have to compare that to the the full sweep of the paradigm of different classes and what they do in addition to attacking. But I, I think th it's a good bedrock to look at. I think I think that I think that the things that they should be getting would be would be would be um would be cases of 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 effects that would would be su would be sufficiently po would be sufficiently powerful like say giving giving the rest giving the rest of the party so some some form of re some form of regen or get or giving them ha or giving them haste or pr or protect or the, or the like okay, so I... here's one more thing to consider I, and I'll, I'll let you talk after this so this this is important though okay. okay so it is fun here's my thesis it is fun to roll the die once a turn that's the core thesis. Mm -hmm. So if they're just standing there and just passively say, I use my turn to sing everyone else's cool stuff, they're not getting to have that fun as a player. So are what are we giving them instead? I'd, is everyone else getting cooler this doesn't is, sound as much fun? Um I, I was I was trying to I was trying to avoid taking notes from the thirteenth age bard, but in this case I I may end, I may end up having to because no, I was Good. That was going to be my point, mm -hmm. Monk. Just thirteenth age. It the bard in thirteenth age has thirteenth age has two different ways of doing their ma their their songs. They can do songs as that full that full action that that rather than as a flexible action or anything mm -hmm. like that. And that's like a bigger effect. But then they also have the the uh, the the battle cries, yeah. which are basically one note songs that they did during an attack. Mm -hmm. And it was it was basically their flexible attack, which the thing about flexible attacks, Joel, is that they, is that they um put a lot of importance on the on what you roll. Um, some of them will activate on a natural odd, some on a natural even, some on a natural ten plus, some on a natural fifteen plus, and so on. Cool. Stuff like that in uh, Tian Shang too, where the the thing that you roll on the die matters. I I love effects. I'm a total sucker for them. So. Yeah. Yay, Thirteenth Age! A, a brilliant piece of game design, mm -hmm. really. I love Thirteenth Age. It's such a good game. So i I think sure. it, I think in the the only the only rule when it comes to when it comes to these kind of when it comes to even the battle cries, is that it should not it should not benefit them directly. So if, yeah, if, if they're going to use a battle cry, they're attacking and then giving a, a smaller effect to the to the. Uh, to the the party, but I think that unlike in Thirteenth Age, where even you know their their full act, their standard action songs don't affect them, I think their standard action songs should affect them because in Final Fantasy, a bard's standard action song, where they're mm -hmm. just sitting there playing, does affect everyone, including themselves. Yeah. And here's a here's another brainwave. What if they can do like a passive effect, like everyone gets regen, but also they get to roll a d20 to do some other thing that is like song related. So like that's kind of like the power chord that they hit. Um, uh, so that's like, that's kind of that's that's kind of why he brought up the um, 13th age bard because that's covered as well. When they yeah, do when brilliant. they activate a song, um, normally it would be a case of the opening effect, um, and that and then the and then the final verse. But you can but you can do a maintain role in order to in order to keep do in order to keep doing that um, opening effect. The final verse is, is certainly a bit powerful, but once that's done, the um, the passive effect that they were getting that they were bringing from the song ends. That's neat. That's neat. I, I like that. And I like that the, there's something kind of musical to it. It it, mm -hmm. it manifests in a simple but very eloquent way in the rules. Uh, I think this is my favorite one you've thrown at me so far. I, it's a little thirteenth age heavy, maybe, but honestly, if you're gonna steal, dude, steal from the best. Thirteenth yeah. age freaking rocks. Um, next is Chemist. Um, there were some games that had a Alchemist class, but they're basically still the Chemist. Chemist yeah, is bad. our item monkey. Anything that does a thing with two items to make a new effect. So, that's the original Chemist job, that's the Alchemist jobs in some of the, in, in a, I believe it was FF11 or, mm -hmm. and in... 10-2. In, in um, tactics, didn't they just give you the ability to throw items? Like, it was something really, really basic that felt like it should have just been, like, one of the core game moves, but, like, it had, you, like, you had to learn it by being a chemist, didn't you? Well, chem chemist was also a tier one job. Yeah, like, it was, like, a real basic thing in that mm -hmm. game. <laughs> but in this yeah, case, I mean, we're yeah, having... Item monkey makes sense. And, of course, of course, the, um... 
the big the big thing the big thing with them is being is being able to mix um being able to mix item effects. So some somebody else might be able they they would they would be the kind of person who who um who could who could who could figure who could um who could turn a who could literally make a healing grenade for for instance. Okay. Um I'd probably I'd probably take a few cues from the bomb making effects that the alchemist has in Pathfinder actually. I think for once, I really think that Pathfinder is a good thing to yank from uh, for a class like this one. Mm -hmm. Actually, I really like the idea of a class that has a bunch of ingredients that each do have like a, kind of a limited effect, and they can we can swap them out depending on the tactical circumstance to get very like much much narrower but more potent effects, yeah. so that they so constantly like... have some nifty thing they can do. So you'd like Patissier from Bravely Second? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, no, that's in, cool. In... In Bravely Second, they had to collect very specific patissier ingredients that you could either buy in town or get from collecting while in the middle of battle, and what you collected in the middle of battle changed depending on the region you were in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then it did very specific effects based on what you, you, uh, you mixed. There were some effects that were entirely way too broken, like a pie that could literally put, uh, put instant death on yourself, which is sometimes what you needed in order to activate effects of other classes. Mm -hmm. I had a broken build that, that kind of relied on that. So, Next is yeah. Covert Ops. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Do, oh, I, I hear something. Shiny black shoes? Dark <laughs> navy suits? What is this? <laughs> what, what, is, what is this? It's the fucking Turks! Yep. Oh, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a get it. I'm a get it. Hold on. <laughs> I wish I had a shaker to use. I really do. But uh, for for effect, Joel in council. This this is what you should be listening to right now. <laughs> Beautiful. I think when, this is the first Final Fantasy I ever actually played to completion was seven, so I, I've got a I've got a soft spot for the Turks. Now, in Final Fantasy D twenty, there was a prestige class all around being a uh, being a Turk, to the point where um where when you go into the class, you have a custom made suit that you have to wear in order to get its class abilities, and I just loved it. That is kind of brilliant. Um. You're not a Turk if you're not wearing the suit. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not wrong. The the covert ops track is for people who want who want to put a little bit of spy flavor within the, within their particular approach. As for all intents and purposes, the Turks are the are the intelligence arm of Shinra. Oh. Yeah, Shinra. And. The entire reason we renamed it Covert Ops and did a little bit of flavor tweaking is so that it wouldn't be so tied to setting. Yeah. But if... and I think that's 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 valid, mm -hmm. you know. I think that's valid. So this um, this because of that this this ends perfect up perfect example of a I'm sorry, they're almost a perfect example of style over ability cuz I they really didn't have a whole lot of special stuff they did. They they were almost entirely presentation. A lot of Final Fantasy VII was that, uh, in that I mean the materia I made power is like literally swappable between character types. Like your class basically was irrelevant in that game, so it's a really good example of the like different art but same abilities uh, thing we've mentioned before. Yeah. Covert now with covert ops, this is, this is going to be one instance of a particular type of skill monkey for people who for people who want to have a for for people who want to have the un, the underhanded form of um, of so of social of social kind of tricks, this would this would be the track for them. Um, specific specific specifically for the um for the I know a guy kind kind of kind of people. Um, and taking a cue from Black Cats Gaming's the spy the spy game, I would probably have it that. They ha that they have a they have a certain number of cover identities that they c that they can um, that they can utilize. 
because of because of course of course you can you can never even trust the name of a spy. But I actually really like that. Um, I, I remember that there were prestige classes for things like spies in a in three five. I think that's where I encountered them most frequently. But I think it's design space that isn't like. And maybe it's because it, it's, it, it's not as cleanly combat-focused mm -hmm. as something like the, uh, the, the sort of DPS and the tank roles that you see in, like, Fighter and Thief and stuff like that. But I think it's fascinating design space nonetheless because it orients itself towards this understanding that there's this broader setting and that what you do in that broader setting, like, it determines what kind of and, and how frequently and, and what the stakes are of the combat you enter. And I think that's really neat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's neat that there's a, a track that you can add that almost universally makes any other two tracks that you choose way goddamn cooler and more stylish. So there's at least two reasons I love it. And those mm -hmm. are, there they are. <laughs> and hang, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. Um, the next one is Engineer, which um, as an engineer, I solve practical problems. Not and I, I don't mean your I don't mean your unlike your unlike your unlike your conundrums of what of what is beauty because that falls into the conundrums of your philosophy. What I saw I I saw things like what if some mean Mother Hubbard wants to tear me a structurally superfluous new beehive? The answer use a gun. And if that don't work, use more gun. <laughs> the en the engineer is 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 a is a whiz with get with gadgetry and yeah would be taking some notes from the from the TF2 style engineer. Yeah, yeah I, I mean tell you, these are intriguing mm -hmm. fucking classes too. I, I like these. Well, and we uh, engineer includes something like the machinist from a uh, from Final Fantasy fourteen, which is literally. A steampunk gunner with steampunk flying turrets. <laughs> yeah. I'm so the, the, the I'm down for that. That's great. The approach the approach that they that they would have is that they could they could they could you they could pull out say an auto crossbow and and utilize that, or they or they can or they can play or they can um place it on on certain on certain parts of the battlefield so that. It, so that it operates on a soft AI kind of approach, i.e., if some if somebody enters within range, they, it automa it automatically shoots at them. Um, you don't need an IFF when everything on the battlefield is your enemy. Yeah, it's neat that they kind of have traps. I, I like that. That's a really fascinating thing to do, especially because like. I feel like they could play a more minor and supporting role as a, as a basic thing, but they could still lay traps that were as effective as having a f like almost a full character at a certain like critical point in the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's cool. Um, yeah, there's, that's that's really interesting. Elder. There's also the fact that I've always I've always want I've always made attempts to try and have trap centric um, ro um, rogues in my D and D campaigns in some form or another. And I've already told you guys about the up button. The up button. It's am it's amazing how it's amazing how many um how many ideas I lifted from Looney Tunes back in the day. Uh. Oh, no, tell me about the up button. I don't remember this one. <laughs> For the benefit of our of our new listeners, who obviously flocked to your banner when I joined, uh, <laughs> tell us all about the up button. It is a it is a runic trap that I that I ca that I came up with as a as a um a, a bit of a, a bit of a a bit of a gag. It's he he writes a set of runes on on a, on a piece of paper, places it on the ground. Whoever with the first person who steps on the on the um, on the immediate area of this trap is treated as if they cast fly on themselves straight up. At forty miles an hour, for six seconds. Oof! <laughs> it doesn't. It does not matter how how light or heavy you are. You step on the thing, you go up. This culminated at the at, at the end of the campaign when we were dealing with a with a um, dragon in the in the bottom of this dungeon, and he he um he t he ends up stepping forward and he steps right on the trap. 
and my GM goes, um, that's that's not gonna work. There's a there's 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 a he'd end up hitting the ceiling. Yeah, and forty miles an hour. <laughs> first first second he hits the the thing is it it doesn't matter what's in the way. You go you're supposed to be going in that direction at that speed for that amount of time. No exceptions. If some if something's in the way, either either um you either it gets broken, either you break through it. Or, or it breaks you. It breaks you, and in this case, the latter happened because the ceiling was made of adamantite. Yeah, sorry, dragon, because it's not like I mean, because if you're going up, regardless of your mass, the conservation of uh, of inertia is is still there. So, like, it's your speed times your mass is the amount of kinetic force that's bearing down on you when you hit the indestructible ceiling. So. Yeah, it's that had to be a hell to clean up. Clean up in aisle two. Yeah, the 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 GM had the GM to try and get back at me described in detail how the how the dragon was literally um, crushed to death because it was basically in it was basically in a compactor <laughs> through oh. through this whole thing. Hey, and how I, big was the dragon? Because you're talking about a lot of mass moving at forty miles an hour. Um, this what this was in in um. In mini size, a a um, a four by four. Oh man, that's that's really big. That's a that's what we call. Um, hey, is it toothpaste yet? Because then all of its guts and blood would split out all the sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, just imagine shooting it out of a cannon at forty miles an hour and hitting a concrete wall. I mean, like, I don't care how powerful you are as a dragon, you're a stain, dude. You don't have to have to wait for it to continue going up. The initial impact would explode it everywhere. Also true. Yeah. But then, but anyway, the um, the gambler I'd say is a, I'd say it would be a relatively easy class to um, easy track to handle. Um, it throws money, and it also uh uses money for for random effects that aren't always necessarily beneficial. The approach, the approach that a lot, a lot of times, the approach that's taken is the is the reels approach. You know, sl the slot, the slot machine thing. Um, I'm, th I am, th I am thinking of, I am thinking of keeping, of keeping that of that same approach. But I do, th I do think it's sh I instead of have ins instead of having a bunch of subsystems for each each type of um reel as it's as it's happened in um other approaches, which. In those ca in those cases that. in those cases it can it can work because you're not dealing with a whole lot of um, cross classing but since we are we can't re we can't really do a a individual system for status reels for element reels and so on that's well I mean y if you want to get technical all reels really are are dice except in the form of a slot machine um. Let, yeah. let me get let me get to let me get to the the approach the, the approach that I'm that I'm considering using. Um, okay. Now for 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 the for this for this kind of for this kind of approach, you with the reels you are ro you are still rolling you're still rolling three you're still rolling um three dice. What's going What's going to change is the die size. So at a low tier, you might roll um, you might roll three d six, but at the highest tier, you might be rolling um, three d twelves. That's cool. And you get more effects at the higher it goes. Yeah, the the different, uh, the, the different the, combinations of your different things that makes that would make me so happy. Well, here here's here's the uh, here's the here's the approach I'm considering. Um, you. I I I'm actually considering having I'm actually considering having it that instead of rolling three you're rolling um five. Oh wow! Now here now here's here's where here's where things are here's where things are going to get interesting. Um, let's let's say let's say that you're let's say that you're rolling for a for a um for an el for an elemental effect. If you in this regard, if you roll a set. Then you then you apply then you apply a you apply a more you apply a a um, a actually no I take that back if you're rolling a straight then you're applying that of you're you're adding you're applying the total of that effect to one target 
if you roll a set, you're applying that effect to as many targets as the number of matching die you rolled. Ooh. So actually, so because I'm designing a die matching game, what mm -hmm. you want to do is start with the big dice and then slowly reduce the size of the die. So if you start with a d12, sets are unlikely. But if you start with if you end with d6s or d4s even, sets are extraordinarily likely. I feel I feel like I feel like d d4 would d4 might be might um there's not the you would if you, if you're rolling five d fours you're going to end up with a with a with a set or a straight or a straight no matter what. You, no, you would have to do, if you're doing five, yeah. Um, um, I think probably capping it at d sixes is wise, especially since that kind of works in with that a uh, was it a seven slot system with the tracks. Uh, yeah, seven circle system. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So. And it's easier to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I was actually going to to go a little bit a uh, little bit different with a suggestion. That's a really good one. Um, I I was thinking that uh, the set, you know, uh, of everything but the highest number on the die would be your your you know your t however many it is is uh, by the number of dice matching mm -hmm. and each higher set of numbers would do slightly more effect but if you said if you for example got all sixes when you um that's that's the eponymous and titular the end um Ooh, as tempting as that as tempting as out. that is no oh Come on, we gotta have the kill the entire enemy party effect in there somewhere. Nah, nah. I've um... <laughs> well, for first, even though even though I don't care for him these days, um, you have that kind of thing, and then and then next thing you know, um, one of the other one of the other player characters is gonna go, "We're a fighting like man," because because. You look because you look at a you look at a at a kill all like that, and what I see is one, two, three, four, or however many potential kill steals. I mean, but if the luck is on your side, yeah, you are a gambler. I don't know, man. And remember, you're bookending this with the "I killed the big boss in a single attack" story, so. <laughs> I think we got you on this one, Mildred. I, I, I wiped out this elder beholder in its own lair by just one pull of my slot. I'll, I, it's one of, it's one of those put it under consideration kind of things. It's just a matter of how, of how would I work it in with, the, with the, um, with the straight and set approach, approach that I've just mentioned. You could, I, I think it could work if you, for example, uh, at the time. Maybe you'd have to roll all sixes to get onto the, the end reels, and then you'd have to roll another matching set. And, and it could be any matching set, but it'd still have to be a matching you'd set. Even, you'd even say, okay, like, assuming that you begin at d12s and d6s, you mm -hmm. even say, if you roll all ones, you get the end. Because that's extremely unlikely with d12s, and it's still pretty unlikely with 3d6. That's yeah. what, a 1 in 36 chance? So that's not common enough that it's, like, super considerable. It's way cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Next is the general. Um, the general, it, the general, sty stylistically is for is for those um, char characters whose jo whose job entry was a special job of military rank of some kind. Um, or the, but or... was wasn't the general the the guys who control battlefield flow? Yeah, these are these are the guys. This is this is, this kind this kind of track is a bit of a reincarnation of the fourth edition warlord. And warlord was a beloved class from fourth edition. I don't know if there's an equivalent in thirteenth age, but there is. Man, it, there it, is the commander. Oh. Yeah, it, it's it's one of the things that kind of disappeared with fourth um, tragically, but it was people freaking loved this class, and it's easy to see why. I've, it, I've it seen some it really... I've seen some people argue that the battlemaster um, subclass for fighters is the is the incarnation of the warlord. I do not agree. New one. I can see that. Uh, I mean, I can see the argument, but no, I'm I'm on your side with that one. It just doesn't. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it doesn't do the same thing for the same reasons. Um. 
because because of because of that, I think I think that the the um the general is 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 all it, its com its particular commands are all about um all about all about battlefield control and i th i think one of the th i think one of the things that it would probably do is a lot i'd say a lot of its effects would be would be um out of turn re out of turn re out of turn reactions that they set up um this it's i i guess i could i guess i could say it's like set it's like setting up um tr trap cards in Yu-Gi-Oh. You're s they'd be they would s during their turn they would set they would set up um tactics let, for the take for the sake of it let's call these tactics let's call these let's call these abilities gambits um it's exactly the word i would have chosen for them let's say let's say for let's say for instance and with each of these each of these gambits the the key thing with their effect is that a trigger has to be chosen um, that trigger could be if some if if a if an ally if an ally gets hit if um if an ally hits if they do a critical if they um if they move if they att if they attempt to move out of melee and and so on. Um, the eff the effects that they might give are th would could be could be things like them be in the case of somebody trying to move out, move out of melee. They don't. They don't provoke opportunity attacks for for that movement. Or if some if somebody manages to land a um a a, a um a, a attack, then they're then they're able to they're able to push it into the direction of an a, of an ally. You know that kind that kind well, of. I don't know if this is coming through um an auditory way, but my my pupils are visibly dilating as I absorb the genius of this class. I love this. <laughs> um, well, because think about it. At the core of this class is the super simple if-then statement. If yes. this comes to pass, then you get this effect. And it and reminds me of uh, so held actions. Mm -hmm. Reminds me I of held actions it, from so many games. Yep. But it's nowhere near as awkward as that. Because it really feels like you, as a player, are setting up these plans in advance. And then when it comes to pass, you get a payoff mm -hmm. based on having already figured out a way to do that. It's, oh my god, I love that. Yeah. At least we aren't setting up as many if-then statements as Yandev. And the thing is, the brilliance of it is you could get more broader or more interesting if statements, and you could get more more powerful and varied then statements as the class progresses. Holy stole crap, this whole great. You, whole, you stole this whole say Monk. What? You stole this wholesale from Final Fantasy XII. <laughs> I'm not kidding. The entire gambit system in Final Fantasy XII that allows your characters to autoplay the game is an if-then setup. It is. Yes, it, it is 100%. It, but you know what? I really love XII. That was what I love XII love too. The gameplay of it. That game got universally panned, and then when the re the reimagining of the gambit system showed up in a Bioware RPG called Dragon Age Origins and renamed from gambits to tactics everybody loved it they're like this was great and i'm like you didn't like it six years ago this asshole or three years ago or however many years after but they should be called gambits because they're if statements and the if might not come to pass that's a gambit because you're literally mm -hmm. gambling on the outcome i love it yeah mm -hmm. oh, i love it now i was con i was considering giving them a list of str of strategies and tactics um the difference, be the difference between the two is, is on a micro and macro scale, i.e., a um a strategy would be if if dur if during if during this session we end we end up encountering s say um say say um let's let's go with let's go with undead if we end up encountering un if we end up encountering undead then we get then the party gets this benefit for the for th for the um. For it's, for the first round of that encounter, um, something something like that to reflect that a that somebody who's a strategist is going to is going to know both the enemy and know the um, know how to utilize the allies as well. They're gonna you send to it. That. You've got to be careful with that because what's the difference between having that as a class feature and just buying the stuff you need to fight the undead? Was any class? That's the thing. 
you that... can plan mm -hmm. with any character in an RPG. That's ultimately why, I, why I'm not. I didn't. I didn't say I was going with that approach. I'm just saying I, I'm. It's. Yeah, no, I'm agreeing with you. Though. It's a consideration. Um. The next one is Gunner, and this is almost self-explanatory. Yep. Almost. Oh, well, now. There, now the obvious the obvious question that that can come up is what's is what's the difference between between art between uh, what's the difference between Engine, archer and gunner right. archer gunner and engineer because mm -hmm. engineers use guns too yeah most of the time engine engineers can engineers can use engineers can use firearms but the me, the method that in, the method that an engineer has when it come when it comes to their firearms is is for is for their own is for their own personal defense. Um, the the key the key with it the key with engineers is is set is setting up the is setting up the battlefield to be manipulated by them. With art with archers, it's all about it's all about accuracies. Gunner, I see gunner as the as the more wild west as the more wild west the more gunslinger the more um the 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 more um, Jean Wu approach when it comes to when it comes to ranged combat. So he does trick shots. Mm -hmm. But that, in the sense in the sense of being very being very mobile, and be and re and relying and relying on sh and relying on tactics of short to medium range, instead of instead of being a long range centric approach that the archer would do. Also, it's. It's not. It's not really about patience. It's about um, needs more DACA. So, so we're looking at our Aaron Black here, then. Yes. So, what's the mechanical way in which that manifests? Um, like, like, really simply. The, I'd. I would say. I would say the. I would say the. Um, I would say. In, I'd say when it comes. When it comes to. When it comes to their mechanics. There's a there's a few there's a few things that come to mind. One, one of them was one of them was try, was trying to do some variant on a on a six on a six gun effect, but I don't I don't really think that's go, that's going to work. Um, the 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 other the other that I well um the other that I'm that I'm cons, that I'm considering. Is is the is the fact that they that um they they kind of they they have um unlike the archer they're gonna have a mu they're gonna have a much higher um a much higher a much higher fire rate but they have to ma but they have to manage their um reloads um beyond the, beyond that as far and of course of course there is the there is the possibility of trick shots but the the key, th the key thing, w the key thing with them is that they they are going to they're going to be at their best in the th in the thick of it when they're when they have when they're outnumbered. Um, because I will admit I'm taking a bit of I'm taking a bit of cues from say the Grammaton cleric. Yeah. Oh, I, I designed a whole kung fu style around that, so like, man, you're talking to the right guy. Yeah. <laughs> um. The the key, the key thing with the key thing with the with the um, gunner is, I, I know you're get, I know you're gonna get mad at me for bringing it up, but I have to bring up Trigger Happy from Ten Two. I'm not mad at you about that. I liked Ten Two. I'm, like I'm, refer I'm referring. To, I'm referring you, to Zan here. And as I said <laughs> earlier. You are allowed to be wrong, Joel. We live in a country where you're allowed to be wrong. What can I do for you to change your mind about Tin Two? Um, you can't. Remember, I sh I gave you the song from uh from the from the from the fucking guys. That was most unpleasant. I'll grant that. As yeah, rails. The point. He deserves the point it. Is, he deserves it. The point <laughs> is that I'm, that I'm con I'm con I'm cons I'm considering t I'm considering taking an taking an approach where um for for the gu for the gunner it is all it is all about it is all about some um, momentum because in in some ways the gun the the way the way that the gunner should should kind of be portrayed is not 
is not too far removed from a lot of the is a lot of the gun centric action films that we've that I've referenced, as well as um, as well as well as the gunplay in certain um in cer- in certain as they're ter- as they're called these days boomer shooters. And because of that, I f- I feel that they sh- I feel that they should be on a momentum mechanic, wherein fi- firing, moving, not getting hit, is how they build and mo- and maintain momentum, which is u- which is utilized for their trick shots. You know, looking at Ten Two's gunplay abilities and and trigger happy, do you know what this reminds me of? What? There there was a better reference you could have made. Final Fantasy VIII. Irvine. Irvine does the same exact thing that happens here. The, the yeah. shot types are, are exactly what the gunplay abilities are. Mm-hmm. You just have to have the ammo. And trigger yeah. happy, you just pull the trigger as many times as you can during the... Mm-hmm. That's his limit break. Yeah. yeah. That's a player-facing skill thing, though. So, like, how does that translate into a TTRPG? Because you're not... Like, how fa- how many dice can you roll in a certain amount of time is not yeah. really as satisfying as a mechanic. And I, I don't I don't like doing I was I was considering doing um um roll roll until roll until you miss but th- but um that could go ro- that could go wrong very quickly if the dice gods are in the right mood. I think so, that what you should do is literally set dice up on the far end of the table and make them throw dice at them and if they hit them then they get that attack. There is no way I can put that in a book and you know it. I'm not saying it's possible. I'm saying it's great. Yeah, but the the approach the approach that the approach that I, that I am that I am considering is, um, they ha- is that they have a mo- they have a momentum pool that's a momentum pool whether it be whether it be a die type or whether it be an actual number, whichever you prefer, that starts at zero. Atta- if whenever th- whenever they whenever they um, if whenever they at Whenever they attack, and whenever they attack, or whenever they do, whenever they manage to not get hit, then they, then um, they're then and they're t- able to. They're, attacking increases momentum, mm-hmm. and not and um not get spending a turn not getting hit is a means to maintain momentum. Okay, I was gonna say by not get hit. Uh, did you mean specifically they're rolled at and it misses, or just their momentum is is contained so long as no attacks hit them? Yeah. Um, and so the the latter then that's good. Um, I almost another way you could go with that is doing like a remember in uh, Duke Nukem where you got the ego mechanic. Do a thing like when they take a trick shot, which is like a like a penalty on a roll. Mm-hmm. If they hit with it, then they get a little ego, and they can do like they can use that pool to do extra attacks and crazy stuff like that later on. Uh, Flurry are you, of are you referring? Are you? I don't remember Ego in Duke Nukem 3D. Are you sure about that? I don't remember. What, it, it was like instead of health, you had like Ego or Vanity or something that, like that. That was, was that was in Duke Nukem Forever, and we don't talk about Duke Nukem Forever. That's tragedy because it's, I love Duke Nukem in all his forms, all of them, Mildra. I like you I mean, like the Duke too, but I don't. But Forever, uh, but Forever, I don't want to talk about because of because I hate Randy. Yeah, like, Randy Pitch Randy Pitchford's an asshole. We don't like him. Fair enough, but that was a fun mechanic, and I I, I thought that was very characterful for the Duke. So it I mean, was, that's true. It was, but um, it did it be- it did it better a few years ago, or a few years let's, later, I should say. Yeah. Let's just say let's just say, uh, in this house we stand Dick Kickham, and he uh chews ass and kicks gum, and he's all out of ass. <laughs> but. The the things that the things that this momentum would would be would be spent would be spent on are thing are things like trick shots or to um or to or to help with their maneuverability like the like be, being able to being able to move without without um, provoking attacks of oppor- attacks of opportunity or um being or being able to do um do shot do um shot on the runs or do, or even do shot on the runs against against um two targets at once i, I think that feels very gunslingery well con, con, retaining the dyna- like the dynamism that you mm-hmm. want for a club on a class like this yeah that's kind of what i did with my gunslingers too like their their move set is all about if they get too close defend and find a way to move away while shooting them into cover and mm-hmm. then get behind cover and shoot them a lot yeah and like i that sounds simple and kind of dumb but honestly it's really fun to play mm-hmm. so 
Yeah, I, I'm, I stay in this class. But the big, the big reason that it, the big reason that I went with this kind of momentum approach is, what are what are the three when you're dealing with any ninety shooters? What are the three words that you have to have drilled into your head? Never stop question. moving. I was thinking duck and cover, but okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> duck we're and cover. We're dealing with 90 shooters, not Gears of War. Everything will work out fine. Um, Just duck and cover. Anyway, continue. <laughs> Next is Mediator. And, um... I do, th I do think that this would be another one where the features are more on the social end of things. Specific, specific, and since there, since there is a um, social encounter subsystem within Legend, I think Mediator would be would be a track specifically designed to take advantage of that kind of thing. Makes sense. Uh, what's the distinction between a social encounter and like the just the normal fights? Because um, you have to understand, I actually just just this week uh, grabbed a copy of Vampire Fifth Edition, and they've got a really cool. Uh, like comparison between their social system and their uh, their fighting system, they they basically both damage you in in important but distinct ways. So you can blend them even in the same scene to its fascinating effect. Um, I covered it. I covered it in my review, but there are but there are certain um, but there are certain there's a kind of there's a kind of subset of rules when it com when it comes to when it comes to skill ch when it comes to skill challenges involve involving t involving tokens or go or success based goals it's it's mm -hmm. it's significantly varied depending on the kind of thing that the gm wants to set up and mm -hmm. um chases mm -hmm. they one of the chases one of the chases is blatantly taking some parkour notes um <laughs> Chase mechanics can be a lot of fun in RPGs, so yeah. I'm I'm interested. So I I do think I do think that when it comes to the when it comes to the mediator, that would be that would be a, a an appropriate um, setup to go with. Um, the ne mm. the next one is one that um arguably I should arguably to some I should have skipped, but I think there I think there's some useful enough things with them that I decided not to, and that's the squire. That's that's a hard sell, but tell me your reasoning. Um, the approach the approach that I'm, the approach that I'm taking with can let's consider the likes of um, of T of um, Titus. Um, a lot of okay. a lot of his a lot of his um, abilities that he's get, that he's gonna have access to pretty quickly are um, are squ are essentially squire abilities. Define squire abilities for us. Um, Thing, things things like things like ch the the approach with the approach with with a lot of the abilities that squire had especially in tactics are things that are that have utility but aren't necessarily flashy mm. learn um, the ropes kind of class yeah and beca because of that i see i see i see squire as a kind of a kind of role filler a kind of a kind of backup role filler so that so they um they're able to. They're able to. They're able to fill in a partic a particular gap. So obvious. Obviously, they do. Ha they do have. They do have some buffing abilities that aren't going to be as good as as some other um, setups. But they. But they. Um, but the. Pro but the approach is. The approach is certainly that. The approach is certainly there. Um, I think I think that the that the be, the best that when it comes when it comes to when it comes to Squire, um, first off, I th I think I think that w one of the things that they should be that they should be able to do is um, sw is switch is switch weapons on, switch weapons a lot more f a lot um freely. As long as long as they're not ma as long as they're not magic weapons, if he, the squire would be the kind of person who'd who'd probably have a handful of different weapons that they can switch between on the fly, and mm. also and also also provide um provide some sh some short buffs and debuffs, and by short I mean I mean one t I mean a um 
one turn kind of thing that will certainly will certainly provide an edge but not necessarily turn the tide yeah, it seems like this is um th this almost seems like uh if you don't have a better idea for like the last pick you have for your character tract like mm -hmm. this would be like kind of the solid one to go to yeah. which is like you said, not flashy design space, but it might actually be really good design space. If this mm -hmm. winds up getting picked a lot, that would that would kind of justify it, just in in terms of raw utility. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, I actually I'm I'm sort of with you on this one. I think uh, it's a little dull. It's not bad. Mm -hmm. Um, the next is Thief, and. I'd, I'd, with Thief, we do, we do have, we do have a, str we do have a stronger background, um, when, it, when, it, when it comes to steel, mug, and the like. Um, I would, I would say when it, I would say when it comes to, when it comes to Thief, we'd probably be taking a lot of notes from the, th from the, um, Thief skills that Zidane has, and obviously not any of the Dine skills because, because that's too setting specific. Yeah, and the dines, those are his um, those are his limit break in that, aren't they? Yeah, those are his trance abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I and there there are a lot of them are just kind of attacks. Um, They're all attacks. Yeah, so and the thief skills are far are more interesting from a from a TTRPG standpoint yeah. because they're doing something that's not just damage. And as a designer, I always love whenever I kind of contrast like something that is like as fundamentally utilitarian as damaging the enemy with something that isn't directly comparable. Mm -hmm. I love that apples to oranges comparison. Yeah. Because you don't really and in Final Fantasy it's really fun to do the steal uh, even if it doesn't really it, it, it's you're sacrificing an attack for it because you don't know the utility in a lot of cases. Sometimes it's just like you don't get anything. Sometimes it's like you get an, a unique item that will give you a huge advantage for the rest of the game. And uh, that's pretty appealing. It's sort of Skinner boxy, but uh, I I can't help it. I love that. Honestly, the 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 approach the approach that I'm that I'm considering with um thief with thief so that it's so that it's still viable even when you're dealing with things that wouldn't have something to actually uh, steal. Is t is taking a taking a bit of a taking a bit of a cue from. From the from the Hang from um, from, from Decidia and T, because Locke, when he was when he was introduced into that, had Steel as his EX skill, um, which al which allows which could allow him to um to pe to take to take I to take items. But in this case, the approach that I'm going to go with with Steel is that. It is simultaneously a debuff and a buff. Your de you are you are your deep you are debuffing the um you're deep you're debuffing the enemy and bu and buffing yourself. Okay, like and what has that justified within the terms of the the game's universe? Like, what are you doing? Um. I'd I'd say I'd I'd say in th I'd say in this re in this regard in s instead of st your s I'm kind I'm kind of pivoting it to um to put to putting a a bit of a ma a bit of a magical end of end of things that you're st well, you're st space, so. you're you're kind of you're kind of being a bit of a um a bit of a a bit of a spell or a key thief in this regard. Hmm. Um. Much like how in a, in a lot of in a lot of um, martial stories we have that we have those characters who dr who drain other people's key to to um, add power to themselves, mm. we're kind we're kind of taking a a, a a approach in a in a um in a in a similar in a similar setup. The fact no, that actually kind of love that too because it doesn't have to be explicitly magical mm -hmm. like think about someone who just takes the initiative of like the footing and the pacing of the fight yep. whenever they just get in close with someone mm -hmm. they're simultaneously debuffing them and buffing themselves and the cumulative effect is very uh, is very impressive and you can still kind of explain that in terms of the sort of like um the sort of thiefy tactics you should see characters like this doing you know where they they kind of seize the the dexterous advantage for themselves so i yeah actually really nifty I, I might i might make it a a version of steel you know instead of just using that as the steel command itself because i feel like steel is 
pretty clearly about taking someone's shit, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think this is as a companion ability that levels along with it is neat. Um, I just I just need to figure out what to call it because I obviously I can't call it steel. Um, yeah, you, you need something that. What would you call that? You're kind plunder. of setting the pace or something. What's that? Call it plunder. Plunder. <laughs> that's still kind of that's a little uh, still that's a, all of all of like the names. Stuff. Uh, you can plunder someone's life. That's an actual sentence that has been used throughout history. You can I plunder suppose. someone's. Um, what You're about mug? Taking... What about mug? Actually, no. Oh. Actually, no. I take I take it back. Um, I'd say mug would be would, be, with a lot of these with a lot of these kind of effects, you're technically making an attack, but you're forgoing damage in order to do this effect, whether it be stealing right. whether it be stealing an item or um, or st or doing the buff debuff. You can even call it like footwork or something like that, where you just get in really close and instead of attacking, you just completely fuck up their rhythm and and start taking flourish to yourself. We've ar we already have we already have sly flourish in in yeah. D in D and D so I'm go so I'm going with that especially when you consider the imagery of a lot of thieves inclu including the most including the most famous thief oh sorry treasure or sorry um treasure hunter um <laughs> Locke. hey he never stole from anyone if you never told him to <laughs> except the dead. Hey, now that's not stealing. That's no longer owned goods. I, you say that to a lich, sir. You look into his grinning skull face and tell him that. I will, as I crush the gem that is his phylactery in front of his face. You're making some wild assumptions about a human being being able to touch a phylactery with no adverse effects. Uh, you're making some wild, wild assumptions that I'm human. Yeah. Touche. <laughs> let's let's not for, let's let's also not forget that um. As as I've mentioned in the past, I've been I um recently delved into Thunderbolt Fantasy. Mm. And yeah, boy. Oh. Rin Setsua is King Dick. But he but he is still he is still a thief. It's just that the things that he steals aren't exactly physical. I have an ability where I can steal someone's heart. That's all that's all I want. Um um, okay, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. He, da, 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 da. Um, <laughs> but he, the, the kind of things that Rin, Rin Setsuwa would, would, is the kind of person who would, who would rather steal someone's dream or, so, or someone's ego, so, something like, something like that. That's actually, some, the thing that's actually precious to them instead of some physical item that they claim is precious. I will steal from you. I was about I, to I say, I, I will steal your esoterica. <laughs> yeah, this is the postmodern thief. They steal meaning. Mm -hmm. um, in that regard, he, um, I'd, I'd say Rin Setsua has a lot more in common with um, Arsene Lupin. Ooh. Lupin the First, like we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Lupin the First. That's not great. not necessarily loop on the third. We don't have ourselves a Goemon Ishikawa the twelfth after all. Yeah. Now the last one for expert is the noble. Um, when I look when I looked at the special classes within um within ta within tactics tactics advance and a few and a few other games, you would see things like village elder princess um. Count, Viscount, that kind of thing. Noble is my catch-all for those kind of for those kind of approaches. This is for those who um who want who want their particular character to be represented with a bit of um political pull. So it's going to help more in the social aspect of things. Yeah. Now the difference we've already mentioned that that there's um that the mediator also helps in the phys in the um social aspect. But they but they help in di they help in different ways. The mediator is going to be helping in the interpersonal end. The covert ops is going is going to be helping in the um in the uh, in the underhanded end. The noble is going to be more o is going to be more um overt. An exercise of like legitimate political power. Yeah, I like that. Um, 
So because you gotta understand about me, like my favorite thing is squabbling nobles. Like that's oh god, if a game has squabbling nobles in it, like I'm sold. So mm -hmm. I I already love this class. So they would, so the the approach the approach that they that that the noble would have over others is if some if somebody wants to do the wants to do the kind of domain play that's technically been in D and D over the years, but is. Always, but I've always felt was a little undercooked, um, until until Axe came along and perfected it. Uh, Axe is so delicious. But continue. Um, they they have they have the ability to call to call upon um retainers and followers of some type. At high at higher tiers, they would be the ones who would autom who would automatically get some kind some kind of um ho some kind of holding and the ability to call in favors. I'm, I'm sold. And, like, honestly, like, Noble is such a... It's almost like a background, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and putting it in tracks of a class like that, really, it feels appropriate for the way you're building this uh, this job-based game. So, yeah. so many character archetypes. Like, mm -hmm. so, so many so many characters, period, in Final Fantasy are this thing, oh yeah, and also they're a Noble. Like, so many of them. So it's actually sort of perfect, thematically. Mm -hmm. Edgar um, and Sabin, anybody? Huh, yep. I'm a... I'm a I'm a monk, and I'm an engineer. Oh, and we're also the twin princes of Figaro. We're also the best characters in the game, if you like to suplex the train! Um, motherfucker, Sabin has been my favorite character since I was five. Final Fantasy VI is my favorite Final Fantasy. Mm -hmm. What is the best Final Fantasy? Yes. See, I told you there's a reason we get along. Because <laughs> you have great taste? Yeah. However, we're go however we're going to cut it off there because because um there's a there's a lot more to cover and we are unfo we are unfortunate we unfortunately have only a limited amount of stamina. <laughs> so the next the so um in the future we are going we are going to be doing a part two of this that's going to cover the mage adept and independent tracks. Oh, I'm waiting for that blue mage. Mm. Um. Uh. Uh, I'm waiting for the independent tracks. There is some stuff in there that I'm I'm all over. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. I can't wait to vehemently disagree with you both about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know if it's been vehement, but it has been some disagreement. Mm -hmm. It's been pretty consistent. And so, but I like playing Devil's Advocate. Of of course, some. Um, of course, there's there's going there's going to be more than our more than our fair share of of um shenan of shenanigans. In the in the coming days, and uh, and um all and all of it all of it will be will be here in will be here as it as it always is on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.